You will hear a conversation between an international student and the accommodation department. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 3. Hello, Accommodation Department. How can I help you? Uh, do you look after accommodation for international students? Yes, uh, we look after accommodation for all the students. Good. I hope you can help me then. I've only just been accepted onto a postgraduate course and I want to know if there is any accommodation available from this September. I know it's very short notice. Mm, yes, uh, it, it is rather late, but I'm sure we'll be able to find you something. Uh, first of all, can you give me your name and student number so that I can find you on the system? Sure. My name is Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Uh, how do you spell that? G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z. -E Thank you. Got it. And your student number, please? S-H-U-3-0-0. Seven one five P G S H U three zero zero seven one five P G Ah, here you are, Department of Modern Languages. Yes, that's me. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions four to seven. OK, now there are several options for postgraduate students. Firstly, there is the Trigon. Uh, this is a new block near to the station and not far from the main campus. Accommodation is what we call cluster accommodation. What does that mean? Uh, there's a small group of rooms, usually six, each with its own bathroom clustered around a lounge kitchen area which is shared. Oh, I see. That sounds good. They are very popular. Uh, the price for these is £99 per week, and we do have some availability left. However, for postgraduate students, there are other options. And what are they? Uh, there's another apartment block called The Cube, located near the west gate of the campus. Accommodation there is in one or two bedroom self-contained flats. So, The Cube is self-contained? How does that work? Well, basically, they're just like ordinary apartments. Each apartment has one or two study bedrooms with ensuite bathroom, a lounge and a kitchen. And what is the price of those? Uh, for the one bedroom, it is £180 per week. And for the two bedroom, it is £110 per week for each person. And can I choose who I share with? If you have a friend and you would like to share with them, of course, we can reserve a two-bedroom apartment for you both. Otherwise, you just have to share with whoever else is there. Uh, obviously, it will be another woman. Hmm. I will have to think about this. Do I have to make a decision now? No, but we don't have much accommodation left, so I can't guarantee that there will still be availability if you leave it too long. Yes, that's fair. I have a friend in the management department who might like to share. I will speak with her and get back to you this afternoon. OK, fine. Uh, do let us know as soon as you can. I will do. Thanks for all your help. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear someone talking to a group of university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Upton University. I hope you are settling in and beginning to find your way around. I know how confusing it can be when you start life at university, and that's why we have Freshers' Week to help you find your feet. Before I go any further, I should perhaps introduce myself. My name is Sally Jackson, and I am the Secretary of the Students' Union, which has organized this week of events for you. You will usually find me in the office on the first floor of this building when I'm not attending lectures. Anyway, down to business. Of course, there are a few things that you are obliged to get done during your first week here, but once you've opened a bank account, if you haven't got one already, senior director of studies to discuss which courses you are going to take and signed up with a doctor, there will be plenty of time left to enjoy the events we have arranged for the week. And have we got a lot lined up for you. Throughout the week from Monday to Friday, Every morning, starting at 10 a.m., there will be orientation and welfare events. These will include tours of the campus, which, as you have probably noticed, is the size of a small town with 9,000 residential students, as well as sessions on developing study skills. We also have tours of Upton itself arranged for you, with a bus leaving from outside this building every afternoon at 5 o'clock. There are a number of interesting things to do and see in and around Upton, so you can expect visits to the castle and museum, as well as the popular Ghost Walk. You'll need to sign up for this one, as numbers are limited. Just put your name on the list on the notice board in the entrance lobby. An important event is scheduled for Monday, that's the day after tomorrow, when we will be holding the academic fair. This is an opportunity for you to speak to students and academic staff about the courses that are on offer. The academic fair starts at 1 o'clock, by the way. There are a couple of other fairs that I think will interest you. First of all, we have the Society's Fair on Tuesday the 16th, which I think is an absolute must. You might not believe it, but the university has over 150 societies and sports clubs you can sign up for, so you are sure to find something of interest to you. That also starts at 1 o'clock, and it will be here in the Union Building. Also in this building is the Trade Fair on Wednesday from 2 until 5 in the afternoon. This one might sound a bit strange because you will find a load of banks and other businesses here trying to get your custom. You will find plenty of bargains and, best of all, a lot of the businesses give away stuff for free. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. We've also got a great entertainment program lined up for you, starting tonight with our welcoming party. We have a top band lined up for your entertainment, but I'm not allowed to say who they are. All I can say is that I am sure you will not be disappointed.
So come along to Blackmore Hall at 9 o'clock this evening to get your university experience off to a flying start. Just one point. I'm afraid this event is limited to freshers only. Because of space restrictions, you can't bring a friend tonight. Sorry about that. There's more fun and games on Monday in the Cotswold Theater here on campus. We have booked two of the cleverest comedians in the country, Paul Frazier and Jenny Brown, for a three-hour show. Paul has assured us that he and Jenny have packed the show with new material, and as they always get rave reviews for their shows, I think we can look forward to an evening of great entertainment. That's in the Cotswold Theater on Monday evening at 7.30. Moving along a bit, on Thursday, there is an important date for your diaries. This is the official Freshers Opening Ceremony, when the Dean welcomes you to Upton University. So remember, Thursday the 18th from 2.30 to 3.30 in Blackmore Hall. You certainly should go to this one, and by the way, light refreshments will be available. At the end of the week, on Saturday, you have the chance to dress up in your smartest evening wear for the official Freshers' Ball. Actually, although it's called a ball, it is quite a relaxed affair, so we are more than happy if you turn up wearing jeans and a t-shirt. The important thing is to relax and enjoy yourselves. Time and place are the same as for this evening's party. Blackmore Hall from 9 in the evening to 3 o'clock in the morning. Right. I think I've covered the most important and exciting events we have lined up for you, but there will be plenty of other things going on throughout the week, so remember to check the notice board in the entrance lobby regularly. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible this evening at the welcoming party. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Alex, asking his tutor for advice about essay writing. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 27. Hi, Alex. Come in. I gather you wanted some help with writing essays. Yes. I'm finding this first term difficult, and I'm worried about the assignments we have to do for January. Well, let me see if I can help. You shouldn't panic about it, because essay writing is a very straightforward process, really. What it involves is organising the information that you want to include. You shouldn't have more than you can easily manage within the word count. Make sure you haven't got too much or anything irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to look at that and work out what you need and what you don't need before you start. And then you just have to think about how you're going to put forward your argument. Oh, that sounds very straightforward when you put it like that. <laughs> but I'm worried I haven't got the necessary skills for writing an effective essay. 
because English is my second language. Mm. Well, perhaps you misunderstand the skills you need. You need to be able to analyse your data, and then I would say the skills of interpretation and expressing yourself are important. Perhaps it's this last one that bothers you, but the more essays you write, the more you will develop these skills. Yes, and I don't quite know how to improve at that. Though, as you say, I know practice will help. Mm. And I need to make sure I've got everything ready before I start. Yes. What is vital to good essay writing is preparation. So make sure you build in enough time to do the research you need. Are there any other sources I can use to help me with essays? Yes. You should go to the library and look through the reference section because there are books that focus on the style we use in academic writing, and those will help you a lot. The other thing that you should think about is what happens when you've actually written your essay. Too many students just complete their work and hand it in, whereas what you should be doing is making sure that you edit it as thoroughly as possible. Oh, yes, that's a good idea. Then I'd pick up any mistakes and also see if it reads logically. Exactly. Uh, the other thing is, again, what a lot of students do is get their essays back, look at the marks, then just file it away. Hmm. <laughs> they don't realise that if they checked it through and looked at what the tutor had written, then they can learn from their old essays. Yeah, I can see that's a good idea. So, is that OK? You can always come back to me. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 28 to 30. Actually, there were a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about essay writing. Uh -huh. I had had a few thoughts of my own about what I should do, such as really taking good notes when I'm reading, because that helps, doesn't it? Mm, I think it improves your knowledge rather than your actual writing. Uh, but one tip I can give you is to try and not read too much. Otherwise, you end up including irrelevant material in your essay. Remember to stay on task. Yes. Sometimes I have problems interpreting the questions correctly. Or the whole question seems overwhelming to me. Mm. What I try to do is highlight the key parts and divide it into smaller chunks so I can manage it. Well, you might find it useful to break it down even further by making sure you understand all the words perfectly before you start. Uh, things like assess or comment and such like. Yes, I see. Sometimes, after an objective analysis, the question actually asks you for a subjective opinion. But you must remember to support your arguments, if that's the case. Mm. Um, one final comment I can make is about using your own words. You must try to do this as far as possible. You're expected to summarise what you've read, not just string together a list of quotations. In fact, you shouldn't have too many. Just use them where it's really important. OK, thanks. Do you read other students' essays when you've finished? No. Why? Is that a good idea? Well, you can confuse each other, so I'd advise against it. But it's up to you. OK. Uh, thanks very much for your time. And that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 4. Part 4. You are going to hear a talk given by Jim Allen. He is going to share some of his findings of his research. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we'll be hailing from Jim Allen, who will be sharing some of the findings of his research project from last term. Jim. Thanks. Well, to start with, a little bit of background about the project. As you can see, our title is something that is relevant to everybody in this part of the world. Water safety. These days, there's a lot more to water safety because of the increasing number and range of boats and other things people use on public waterways. I'd become interested, through reports on radio, about the number of incidents involving small power boats and individual watercraft, such as jet skis. It seemed to me that because these craft were essentially recreational and didn't require licenses to use, there was very little opportunity to influence the users towards being safety conscious. So, I decided to make this the focus of the project. For the research, we mainly relied upon talking to people, asking them questions in preference to using a written questionnaire. We interviewed a wide range of people at a number of popular swimming locations over two consecutive weekends and asked them what they'd observed or experienced themselves. The respondents were both male and female, but the men were just slightly in the majority. We were pleased with their willingness to talk about the subject and, all told, interviewed 145 people over the two weekends. So, what were the findings? As you can see, 86% of people reported having had some type of problem. A surprisingly large percentage, 27%, commented that they had found it necessary to shout at an offending powerboat. But the main type of problem was the deafening sound that some of the boats made. On occasions, this led to swimmers deciding to move to another location. So what strategies did people adopt to ensure their own comfort and safety? Let's have a look at the figures. First, it was noticeable that there were often distinctly different answers between men and women. It was mainly the women, for example, who said they should try to choose places where boats couldn't go, whereas it was usually the men who said, you shouldn't have to move if you were there first, so you should shout at them if necessary. Both men and, oh, sorry, no, it was women, who said, you should call the authorities if the situation gets too dangerous or the powerboat drivers are acting irresponsibly. Then, I had thought it would be mainly women, but both sexes made the point that above all, it's important to get children away from any possible danger. Men were very aware that jet skis could be unpredictable in inexperienced hands. They also made the point that it's much safer to have your car nearby and clearly visible to any watercraft if you're swimming in a relatively remote spot. Finally, wearing visible clothing, men didn't think it was quite as important as women, but both gave it a high safety rating. When we asked them what they thought the government should do to help solve the problem, That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Misbehave, had to find a way to change, had to leave to find my way. Caught up in a daydream, I be in my mind up there almost daily. It's how I pass time, no opinion safely. It's how I understand what I want in this place, see. Cause everybody wanna tell you bad things. What could go wrong? What fame brings what?